And welcome back, Tactical Mother Flowers, to another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. Today, we're joined with a special guest by the name of Wes. I promise I wouldn't give out Wes's last name just for OPSEC here. Uh, Wes is an interesting character. So, Wes is a formal uh, psychological operations, I guess, officer and has some very impressive credentials. Um, I would literally have to take like an hour to read them all, but some of them here um, include obviously a bachelor's in criminal justice, uh, sociology certificate, MILDEC, OPSEC, SEER, anti-terrorism, evasive tech, irregular warfare, uh, just to name a few. And I'm, I'm gonna keep some of those just for us, Wes, just, but U.S. Army combatives, which is cool. We'll talk a little bit about that. You were an instructor in the U.S. Army, uh, crisis intervention. You've also uh, developed a program called ICERS, which we'll get into for your uh, law enforcement uh, agency. So in addition to all of this, you're also an entrepreneur. You run Suppressy Straps, and that would be suppressystraps.com. The links are going to be all down in the bio here. So guys, if you want to check that out, go ahead and do so after the podcast completes. And bro, I'm going to leave it at there and say, welcome onto the podcast, Wes. Hey, thanks for having me, brother. Very thanks cool to be here. On. It's, uh, I've been looking forward to talking with you for a little while, man. Um, I know you and I had worked on some things on Instagram together with a couple of other of the leading tactical accounts. And uh, it's been a pleasure kind of getting to know you so far, but uh, I'm very excited to have you on here, just given the circumstances that we find ourselves in, man. Like, we've got Iran, China, things going on here domestically, all kind of boiling into a big pot to make a big pot of crap here for us. Um, so a guy like you that could come on, give us a few tips from experience, a uh, few insights, what's going on globally. I'm sure you do kind of keep an eye still on what's going on, not just here in the States. Uh, so that would be really good for us and really valuable for us, man. So um, I just want to jump right into it, dude, and say, what are you tracking right now as far as the most relevant things that you think is going on? Yeah, so I know we linked up about a year ago, so it is cool to finally chat with you here on the, the Zoom, I should say, or the podcast. Um, I guess what's current right now is probably um, big tech controlling all our con contingency, com or I'm sorry, our communication uh, mm -hmm. options, whether it be your Facebook, your Snapchat, your Instagram, um, even Parler. They, they Google, Android, and Apple just uh, removed Parler. If you guys are familiar with Parler, it's uh, that free speech, uh, social media app, regardless of how, what you think about all the, the apps or what side you're on politically, the, the thought that these companies will just shut down alternative uh, forms of communication online is kind of scary. Um, and then I was like, well, the parlor still got their website. You know, you can, you can get on and communicate and share thoughts. And then Amazon come along. They're the ones that's hosting it and they're pulling it off tonight, 1159. So I guess communication, um, what, what do we do if, our primary means of communication start getting interrupted or start being controlled uh, what we say and how we say it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, that really is what I think is kind of behind the scenes here going on is these websites all realize that, you know, guys and girls like to communicate with each other. We get together, we hang out, you know, online, we do these zooms, we chat, we talk. Uh, but if they can disrupt the communications, Hey, you know, um, it's probably probably something that's been done before, you know, in combat and warfare or whatever. Um, yeah. So that's that's where the icers come in, man. And we were talking a little bit about this before is these are actually kind of pre-designated response plans that you have on paper that you can hand out to other people. Maybe it's uh, other members of your bug out team or whatever it is. Can you go into this a little bit for us? Yeah. So icers is something that we came out with uh, late 2017, I think. Um and basically what it does, it gives you a document to reference in the event something bad happens um, that would knock out communication, um, whether it be, you know, cell phones being overloaded, like let's say you have some event. I mean, we've, we've all probably experienced it if you're going to like some big football game or something and then the game lets loose and you're trying to call a cab or something, cell phones get overloaded. You can't use cell phone temporarily. But think about that on a larger scale. I mentioned the social media kind of going out here. Um, but if something knocked out our grid, whether it be the power or cell phones, um, what would you do if something did happen and you needed to bug out 
or maybe you didn't know, do I need to bug out? Should I stay here at my house and wait for my family to come to me? What do you do if you can't make contact, if, if you can't call your, your mom or your, your, your spouse or your kid at school and make a plan, hey, everyone come back to the house or hey, everyone avoid going to the house. Let's go up to the, the cabin up there in the mountains or something. So ISERS gives you something to look at. And the way it works is you have categories, you have three categories, and they're basically, they work on a time frame. Um, so now I'm just spitballing because I don't have it in front of me. Um, but so let's say one uh, day one through day seven with no contact, you refer to category one. And so that means everyone knows, hey, we're in category one right now because it's been four days and I haven't been able to call so-and-so. So you would all look at, at the action plan for category one. And that action plan would create like 13, has 13 different things you do. Um, if you're within that category and one may be go to so-and-so's house um, if it's within three hours drive or if cars aren't working um, go to this location drop a message uh, like like a, a message drop behind a gas station behind a, a trash can or something mm -hmm. so what it does it, it creates categories so everyone knows what category they're in and then everyone references an action plan so everyone's on the same sheet of music they know what they're doing the last thing i want is something to happen and, you know, say me and my, my brother, who's three hours away, um, he's like, well, I need to go to my brother's house. And I'm saying the same thing. So we're both traveling in a, in a situation where the roads really aren't safe. We should probably stay sheltered in uh, and we pass each other and we end up at each other's houses. So it, it avoids conflicts like that. It lets you be able to pull resources from different family members or, or your inner circle, whether it be a trusted friend or something. Um, and this, this guide you keep on your phone, download it offline in a Faraday protected phone. You print it. You obviously put it in your bug out bag. You put it in your car. You put it in your safe at the house. You always have, you always know where it's at. Um, so that's what ICER does. It just, it gives you something to look at. So you're all in the same sheet of music and you know when you're bugging out, where you're bugging out to, or if you're simply just going to shelter in place. I think that's a great idea, man. I mean, as we all know, you certainly know this, uh, being in the military and, I'll tell you this from personal experience also, the first thing to go every time Murphy strikes, it seems like comms goes down first, right? Like yep. everything, everything starts with comms going down. Um, so I think that that's really smart, you know, EMP or some kind of, you know, whether it be from a nuclear strike or the sun gives out a CME or whatever, it's a real threat, man. Um, it really, like people don't want to give it enough credit, but it really is kind of a big threat. Um, and last time it happened, what is it? 18 something, the Carrington event, it like fried mm -hmm. telephone wires and stuff. If that were to happen again, we'd be severely screwed. So I guess that's where the Faraday cages and stuff come in. Could you tell us a little bit more about what these are for guys and girls who don't know? Uh, so without going into the scientific aspect of it, because I don't even really know all that myself. Um, it's just a, uh, either a device, a box, a bag, something you can put devices inside of, phones, laptops, radios, and it protects it from, from basically signals, um, radio, electric, whatever. It keeps things from coming in and frying what's inside of it, basically. It, the electricity goes around it, you ground it to the ground or whatever, and it just protects what's in it. Um, and, and there's you know the, the really expensive ones you could actually put a whole car in, um, people make them out of metal garbage cans with layered cardboard. Uh, we make a handkerchief that has the nickel uh, copper liner, so you can actually put them inside your handkerchief and protect them. I, that's kind of a more feasible way when we're going about our business. It's probably more likely for us just to keep our, a handkerchief with us. So if we, we, we hear something that's about to happen, we can drop our phone in there and at least everything on your phone is protected. Mm. Um, which kind of brings up a side point, like your phone is a great resource, even when there is, no Wi-Fi, no cellular data, because you can load your phone with downloaded maps. You can fill it with thousands of books, um, foraging guides and mapping and all sort of stuff. You know, your phone's got a flashlight built into it. Um, it's a great resource. So we, we want to protect something we can refer to if things do go bad and kind of get stuff like I'm not able to obtain all the information for how to survive in an urban environment, but I could put stuff on my phone and refer to it later. Um, Something else you brought up, I was going to point out. I forgot where we're going with that as far as the, oh yeah, you, you mentioned EMPs. Um, I think that's kind of what I prepare for. Not that I think it's the most likely, 
Um, but I feel like if you're preparing for an EMP, you're preparing for other things. Uh, for example, yesterday, the entire country of Pakistan, 200 million people lost power. The entire country. Like this just happened. I don't know if people have followed much of that news, but how many people are in America? Like three, 300 million or something? Yeah, something like that. I mean, that's, that's, that's about the same amount of people and an entire country is out of power right now. Um, due to a fault in the in the grid system. So mm. I think if we all went out of power, well, I mean, that means phones go out within a few hours or even immediately if you don't have, you know, the towers, I imagine they're out. So yeah. all forms of comms went out. Like this just happened. And then you've got um, the guy over there in North Korea who, as of today, says America's our arch rival. Um, they've been teetering on the nuclear aspect forever, which means they have EMP potential. Um, so anything's possible I just say, let's start, let's start planning. We're seeing all this stuff all around us. Now's a good time to, to plan. So we don't have to <laughs> work backwards later. That's like, I always say, man, stay ready. So you don't have to get ready. You know, it's yeah, there you you know, go. between North Korea, freaking China is a nuclear power. Iran's nuclear power now, or will be soon. Uh, it, 2021, man, it, nothing would surprise me at this point. It, anything could happen. Yep. I think they say what today is December 40th of 2020. Like it's still 2020 basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's funny. I haven't heard that yet. Uh, so U S army instructor, man, what were you doing? Um, what were you doing with the instruction in the U S army? Oh, uh, I was psychological operations. So what I did, I taught reclass soldiers. So those that were any other prior MOS, whether it be infantry or supply that wanted to reclass to air MOS, um, I was their instructor uh, for E5s, E6s, and E7s, which were There's a useful. lot of different kind of folklore and legends surrounding PSYOPs in the military. Can you give us kind of a clarified explanation onto what you guys actually do? I guess we do a lot of different things, but the when you, if you boil it all down, we attempt to influence behavior, and we try to do it where it looks like it's not the U S trying to influence mm. that behavior. We try to make contacts with people in other countries, other NGOs or people assets on the ground. And we make it look like that information um, or that, that operation is coming from them because people, if, if we, if we put out messaging all over, say uh, Lebanon, they're not going to listen to us. You know what I mean? So we want to make it look like it's coming from someone they trust in Lebanon um, so we'll make contacts with other people and we'll slowly influence behavior through hundreds of different mediums, whether it be Twitter, whether it be a, an organized soccer event with some underlying messaging at the event itself. Um, it's like a multi-pronged approach to trying to change one, trying to change a hundred different behaviors to achieve one goal, which may be an even minor goal, even to say it out loud. It's like, you know, that's so minor. What does it matter? But when you're doing this nonstop all over, you can, you can make changes. Hmm. That really makes me think about what's going on right now, man. Um, with Twitter, with Instagram, with fate, with all of the social media companies, with the cleansing of the Trump people, right? Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it makes you think, Hey, is this some kind of a psychological operation? What's really going on back there? Yeah. You, you don't know who's all in control of everything. That's, um, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was these cool patches you guys have. And we're going to jump a little bit from the thing to thing in case you, uh, in case you were wondering, hope you guys don't mind, but these patches I want to bring up because they're really cool. Um, it's literally a morale patch that you could put on your side and it's got like survival stuff in it. So a water purification tab, a little chem light, a couple other cool things in there. Uh, Take it away, Wes, and uh, tell us all about this thing. Yes, yeah, so I actually got the idea in a SEER school um, where soldiers were kind of hinted to the idea of putting escape tools behind their the flag patch that's built into their, their uniform. Mm -hmm. um, so if you do get captured, you, you've got like a shim or a bobby pin, um, some Kevlar saw. Um, so I was like, that's pretty cool. So I made a couple of my own just – basically cutting out the back with a razor blade and stuff and stuff in. Mm. And, you know, a year later when I actually ended up starting this super SE business, um, I was like, I'm going to make my own. So yeah, we, 
the, the idea is to keep stuff concealed about your person um, where it's not likely to be taken off or be noticed. And that's kind of transformed to the idea of like just having stuff that you may need, whether it be extra cash, um, some medication, um, a, a lighter, not a lighter, I should say, but matches or something, whether you're out and on a hike and like, crap, I forgot I had my lighter, it got wet or, you know, I overturned in the water while kayaking and my stuff's my bag floated away because I was an idiot. And I didn't dummy cord it down. But then you're like, oh, I've still got this patch on my my jacket sleeve or on my hat or wherever it may be. And you've got some backup stuff in there. So it's like a backup supply kit, um, but also things you might use every day. Like one we designed last year. So my notebook here, it's a some uh, Velcro back patch. But if you hit this button, it turns on a light. Mm. So it's just a Velcro patch, but it's got a light built into it. And it's got slots for those Kim lights, those little mini glow sticks. Mm. Um, so we tried to design patches that have lights built in, patches that dispense duct tape. Um, and of course, the obvious of patches that just have that storage pocket where you could put your own things in the back of the patch, or you can choose one of our pre-designed kits for, for whatever need you may have. That's pretty cool about the patches, man. It's a, it's a really good idea. I, uh, I wish they would make something like that for my turnout gear with the lights, man. Um, it's here. Now, what was that like? I heard from various guys that parts of it really suck and uh, parts of it are really cool. What what can you tell us about that? Dude, I don't know if I really want to get too much into that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so no yeah. worries, we'll, man. We'll pass that if you don't mind. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot that you kind of can't talk about, and I know that Sear, parts of Sear at least, uh, most of it, I guess, I guess, is probably one of those things, but um, – I'm sure it's really lent you a unique perspective. Like you were saying with the patches, you were, you got the idea from, you know, something you saw and you kind of ran with it. Now it seems to me like you kind of get these ideas from here and there and are able to really run with them. And it takes off into something that ends up being very handy and very clever. Is that something that you were kind of always born with? Like you, you, you said before that you came from kind of an entrepreneurial family. Where do you think this spirit of entrepreneurism comes from in you, man? some of it is just kind of seeing my own faults or my lack of carrying certain things. Um, I have bad memories. So there's times where I'll be walking out the door and I forget my, my knife um, mm. or I forget my lighter. So it was like, based on how bad my memory is and not carrying what I need sometimes I was like, well, let me just see if I can, you know, somehow or another incorporate this into a way I'll wear it um, and not forget it. Like the bracelets our paracord bracelets, they have stuff built into them. And it's hard to forget that because I, I wear it. I go to sleep with it on. Um, it's harder to forget something or lose something that's literally attached to your wrist. Um, yeah. But I don't know. It just, you know, I see things. I see things that, you know, m maybe deficiencies in myself that I could better prepare for. And I I'll make it where like, hey, I would use this or I want something like this. So I I'm like, I could probably make this. So I'll kind of fill those those holes you know what i mean and that's that's exactly where i think all great inventions come from someone was telling me once hey if you want something and you got to invent it right like and then that's where all of the great ideas come from i need this they don't make this let me make it and boom run with the idea so here you are now and you're a law enforcement guy um and i'll just leave it at that but how much do you think that your former job in the army translates over to what you do now with law enforcement work? Um, you, you have that discipline already instilled in you, um, which, which you may see in some of the new officers that are coming in like 21 years old. Um, they're a little bit more not taking things as seriously. So I think you, you have the discipline side, you have that, the uniformity and respect for, for authority and um, supervisors and stuff. But that the actual role, I mean, it, it's completely different. But I think that discipline aspect is is probably the best where, you know, I come in and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I take it seriously. Uh, I may have been a little bit older when I first got into law enforcement, but I think that really helps. Yeah. Military to Leo is a, a great transition. It, it really helps in multiple aspects and facets. No, I absolutely think so. I think um, civil service for guys leaving the military, it's one of the best things you could possibly think of. So... What's next, Wes? I mean, you're 
you know, you got your day job, you got your night job where you're inventing cool gadgets, kind of like a cue almost for those of you guys who watch James Bond out there. Anything coming down the pipeline out there that we uh, that we could be aware of? Or uh, two things that we haven't started selling yet, but have been designed and built um, are two new morale patches. Um, one, if you give me a second, I'll grab the sticker version of it. Yeah, you go ahead. Eight seconds. Guys, this is going to be really cool because, you know, Wes makes some really cool stuff. And I'm not just plugging Wes. Like, I'm honestly telling you guys, I've known the guy for a while and the stuff he makes. So every couple of, couple of months or at least a couple of times a year, we try to come out with a new uh, more uh, a new morale patch. And our two newest ones are the Hobo Signs and Marking Patch. Hmm. So this is just a sticker. But um, I don't know if you guys have got – going around like urban cities, New York and stuff. And you see these graffitis, little symbols and stuff, either on mailboxes or fences or walls or whatever. But um, hobos have been using or homeless people have been using signals for hundreds of years. And some of them have stood the test of time. Um, and what, what it'll be is like, if say a homeless person is looking for a doctor for some free, free medical care or something, if one of them finds a doctor and they actually give you assistance, they'll put this marking on that doctor's fence or somewhere around the house. And it signifies, Hey, if you need a doctor, one lives here. Hmm. Um, same thing. If, if, if you're needing a handout for food, this old lady here gives out food or stay away from this area. There's, there's a lot of crime and drug use um, or this is an abandoned house, you know, a little symbol. So it's a way to help out other homeless people. So if, if things go bad and um, we need some extra Intel in an area we're not used to, you can use these symbols um, to help find help for yourself. The same way the homeless people would, you can use the, those, those markings. So we created a patch that has those on them. Um, so we put basically the top three, six, the top 10 symbols that we thought maybe could be used by urban survivalists. Um, we also put the air to ground symbols in there. If you get, if you get somewhere where you need to send out an emergency kind of SOS message. And then we put the FEMA and, in Sarag symbols on there too, which became famous during the Katrina times where you remember seeing the, those X's on the, on the doors after a house was searched. Um, that's good intel too, to know what hazards are in there. Like if you are looking for a place to bunker down, you can look in that uh, right quadrant of the X and it'll list the, the hazards, um, whether it be, you know, COVID-19 exposure or SARS or, um, uh, any sort of viral or infection or rats or whatever it may be. So it's just something to reference so you can understand at a, at a quick looking at your patch, like, okay, the right quadrant means this, or the bottom quadrant means this. So we turn that into a patch, of course, with that pocket in the back where you can still store things in it. And then the other patch we made was the emergency comms patch. And it's basically a listing of uh, radio frequencies and call signs, or not call signs, radio frequencies and channels. So if you need to reach someone for help, it's got the numbers and the frequencies that are most commonly associated with um, calling and uh, obtaining assistance from whether it be government resources or just other prepper networks. Um, and we also put FEMA, poison control, Red Cross on there and a quick uh, ICE card so you can put like your blood type, emergency contacts and stuff. So those are our two new patches coming out. Other than that, Will, my, we, we don't have anything in the pipeline. We're just... We're always working on our downloadable guides. That's actually our top seller now as far as quantity goes. Mm. Um, just having having a resource for people to download and store on their phone and print out. Um, and it's kind of like the Cliff Notes version. So whenever we write a guide, um, it's very straightforward. We don't get into it. None of it are narratives or paragraphs of just talking. We get to the nitty gritty. We say what you need to know. Um, we make it as compact as possible. So you're not scrolling through 50 pages. You're scrolling through like 20 pages and getting the, the real information. Yeah. It seems to me like you guys really put out the information that people need to know and nothing else. And that's refreshing. Whereas some guys use a lot of fillers and they want to just ramble on and hear themselves talk. I don't get that impression from you guys. I think it's really straight to the point, practical information that only what people need to know. That, that's what we go for. I have trouble sitting down reading long pages, so I want something I can look at it and find what I need to and be done with it, you know? Yeah, it makes two of us, man. You brought up COVID-19, and I'm not going to get political here about this by any means, but who would have ever freaking thought, man, that 
a pandemic would sweep across the world and all of a sudden society would just crumble or start to crumble like that really just shows everyone out there that if you haven't been prepping, you better get prepping, right? And if you're not prepping yet, well, I don't know what the hell is wrong with you. At least putting some toilet yeah. paper and paper towels away, right? So that's, a, that's right. What would you tell guys and girls out there? I mean, most of the people that watch our stuff, as far as gutter fighting secrets, are in some way preppers, whether they're, you know, active guys in the military, law enforcement, whatever it may be, or just prepared civilians. But, you know, to everyone out there, just across the board, maybe some advice to us. Hey, what can we do from here on out to make sure that we stay prepared? First of all, just just make a plan, like we said, with ICERs. That, that's a form of a, a prepping plan um, so you know what to do. So it's, it's just the, the knowledge base first, like make your plan, know where you're going, um, reach out to friends or family in areas outside of your city, even outside of your state. Mm -hmm. um, so you have a place prearranged like, hey, if, if I need to, can I come to your house? Because mm -hmm. the last thing you want to do is do what you see in the movies and in these prepper books where you put on a bug out bag and you start hiking through the woods. That's not realistic. It doesn't make sense. If you're doing that, you're, you're going to die. Um, you want to go to grandma's house in Connecticut. You want to go to um, your high, your, your college buddy's house up in the mountains. So make the contacts first and have things prearranged, um, have maps and strip maps drawn out for how to get there in case, you know, Google maps doesn't work. Um, so make routes, how to get there. Um, and, and even if you, it's not a bug out scenario, even if like phones are overburdened or, or whatever, it may be, let's say, say my spouse is in my city, but somewhere, you know, 10, 15 miles away and I'm trying to contact them and I can't cause you know, for one thing, my phone's barely getting a signal out or a text out. She's doing, she's going through the same issue. Her phone's not receiving or sending messages. But if you have an out of town contact, who's maybe not um, struggling with, with cellular reception, shoot a text message to them so they can then shoot that message to your spouse. You're using an out of contact um, communication uh, relayer basically where who's not having trouble. So that way, if you can get a message to them, they can get a message to, to someone else possibly um, whether it be through voicemail or calling or whatever, um, when you're, and when you're in those situations, you know, your phone's constantly, it's roaming, it's, uh, it's draining battery. So have an out of contact, uh, out of state contact that you can leave messages to, um, don't so much like think you've got to go and buy a hundred cans of beans or whatever. You, you just need to have a plan for where you will obtain food and supplies from. Like if something happens, we're going out, the same hour it happens and we're, we're fueling up our tanks or we're running to the, to the, the grocery store with cash in hand <clears throat> before the grocery store realizes this might be our last day in operation. The grocery store may be thinking, okay, power's out. We're still going to stay open. We'll just accept cash. Um, so utilize those first few hours of an event to stock up um, rather than spending thousands of dollars in advance on food that's going to spoil. And if you do do that, that's fine. You know, I do have food stocks as well, but make sure you rotate them into mm -hmm. your actual, your meals and dinner. So you don't have something expiring. Um, but, but know where to obtain water, know where uh, a spring or a river is, um, or some sort of water collection area. Um, it, it's all about the, the knowing it, it, Yeah. It's good to have thousands of gallons of water and food saved up. But if you don't just know where you're going to obtain it and how, and, and that's probably some of the better advice I could give maybe. Yeah. I know. Spoken like a true pro, man. Um, that's all solid stuff. You know, just want to touch on the bug out thing, bug out bag thing is I've been harping on this for years. I see guys with their freaking bug out bags that are as big as they are and they want to go and take their AR and play Rambo in the woods. But I've always said the same thing, man. You're going to die out there in those woods, man. I mean, especially like how much food and water can you carry when that runs out? What are you going to do? Like trap squirrels? It's just, it, <laughs> yeah. It, unless you're a serious woodsman, I don't know too many of those. So, you know, I really think that what you said about the bug out bag is smart. I mean, it was all smart, but that's really something that people need to hear. With that being said, though, um, is there a place for a bug out bag kind of in your prepping arsenal? Yeah, so we call them lines of carry. Your your EDC is your first line of carry. That's that's your knife, your phone, your handgun, um, your lighter, your cash, whatever it may be. It's the stuff you keep on your pocket. You're carrying every day anyway. Um, 
with that, there's a PSK, which is a personal survival kit. And that could be a little uh, Mylar bag filled with some basic survival essentials and like some antibiotic ointment and a lighter and stuff. Um, it could be our, our patches that have the kits built into it. So you want to always have a PSK on you. Um, if you carry a gun, carry a tourniquet, just kind of the basics of EDC. Um, but above EDC, your next thing is your get home bag. And I think that's what a lot of people want to say in their mind is a bug out bag. But, but most of the time, if something happens, we're going home. Like I can't think of many scenarios where crap, you know, the crap just hit the fan. I'm going in the woods. No, usually what's going to happen is we're going to go home. That's where we're familiar with. That's where we can secure our home. That's where we have, you know, if, if you're in the weapons, that's where your weapons and ammo are. That's where your family is going to be. So the first thing you want to do is get home. And, and nine, 99 times out of 100, you want to get home. But sometimes that could be difficult, um, whether you're at work and, and, and work is an hour drive away. Um, if, if the roads are blocked and you can't drive home, you're going to have to walk home. So that hour walk or the hour drive is now a multi-hour walk home. Um, or more if things are really bad. So what you want to have is a get home bag and a get home bag should be with you at your office, should be with you in your college dorm. It should be with you in your car. Um, and it's just the basic essentials. It's designed to last for 24 hours. It's going to have that protein bar. It's going to have uh, bottles of water. Um, it, you're, we're not talking so much of water purification and filters at this point. This is a very short uh, supply bag to get you home. So it's, it, it's going to have stuff like a tarp. If it's raining, it's going to have small things to get you home. So get home first with your get home bag. Make sure you keep your get home bag accessible. Um, I say within arm's reach, but it, it depending on where you live, that may not be, a, you may not be allowed to bring your get home bag up into the office. Um, so have it in your car, have it somewhere stored nearby um, and get home. Your next thing is your bug out bag or your inch load out inches. I'm never coming home. And this is the sort of stuff you want to keep at the house because you, you want to bug out from your home. You don't want to bug out from your office or wherever you work. Um, so get home and your bug out bag could, could obviously be a bag. It could also be a trunk that you've got uh, pre-prepped with supplies. And then you then throw that trunk in the back of your car. Um, and then, then make your car be the, the, the method in which you bug out if at all possible at, at least as far as you can and always keep your fuel you know once it goes below three three quarters full fill it fill it back up keep your fuel filled keep gas at home rotate your gas into your vehicle um and use your bug out bag or your inch load out to get from home to that bug out location whether it be a family or friend's house somewhere a few hours away it's a great point about using your vehicle as your bug out donkey or your bug out horse or whatever it may be now we talked earlier about the threat of an emp whether that's from the sun or from a nuclear strike and there are things that you can do i know forget the gentleman's name well-known gentleman and he makes literally like an emp shield for your car or your garage or whatever and there's i'm sure you could do that yourself at home but in lieu of that i mean let's say you weren't prepared the thing fries your vehicle. You got to get out of Dodge. I guess at that point you're putting out bug out bags and humping it in the woods, right? Well, so yeah, first of all, I actually have that thing you're talking about, that Faraday shield. It hooks up to the battery. I've got it in my vehicle. Nice. Um, EMPs are one of those things. No one really knows what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, some people say if you have an older model car, um, that it may work and stuff. So we don't know what will happen. So yeah, maybe the cars will work. Maybe they won't, but let's go with that scenario. They don't work. Um, plan for that scenario. Bicycles are amazing. You can, you can cover a lot of ground on a bicycle. We, we want to avoid the walking as much as we can, especially if you've got gear, you're, you're toting around with you. So think of bicycles. If that's not an option, think of these little uh, like beach wagons. Like you can buy these little wagons that you could drive on the beach. Um, Something to pull along, a, a, even a shopping cart. If things go bad, commandeer a shopping cart from a grocery store. Anything to help you get your gear moving. Um, just remember, you, you know, if, if you're pushing around or pulling around a lot of gear, whether it be bags and trunks, it makes you a target. It makes you like that guy's got something, especially if they're in like Pelican tough boxes or military bags. Um, so blend in, be that gray man where if you are carrying stuff, like put it in some black garbage bags inside of a shopping cart. Um, get off the road, stay off the main roads. Um, but yeah, if cars don't work, 
first of all, have your have it mapped out. How are you going to get somewhere to cut out as much travel as you can um, and get out there as soon as possible before things start getting worse? So I keep hearing you saying is the mapping. And I think that that's so crucial. Kids coming up today, man, don't even know how to read a, a street map, let alone, you know, plot and azimuth or anything like that. How important do you think navigation specifically, I guess, A, land navigation, and then B, you know, just street navigation would be? I'm trying to think of like, you know, the, the basic, the army land nav and, you know, where you're shooting azimuths and things like that. I, I don't see that being, at least to, in the initial stages, being something that we want to focus a lot of time on. Mm. Um, but maps in themselves, whether it be, you know, the printed map of your county and of your state and then a, an actual country map. So you're going to want three maps, um, that local, that semi-local, and then the whole nation, um, depending on where you're going. And then you also want, like I said, strip maps. And that's something you're just going to hand draw. Um, and it's using... Uh, landmarks as things to reference. It's using street names and stuff like that as well, but it's just showing that singular line, point A to point B, basically, with maybe some alternative routes planned into it. Um, but it's the smallest way you can have a map and stay focused where you're going, um, where you're not having to pull out this map and keep looking, focusing on where you're going the whole time. Um, so have have strip maps, and everyone can Google what a strip map is and learn how to make one in just a moment. Um, so think about that idea as well. It's important, you know, phones go out. Um, even yesterday I was trying to bring up something on Google maps and it wasn't working. Um, prior to the DC riots, I know a lot of people were reporting that maps wouldn't navigate to DC, um, in the hours leading up to it. And, you know, that's just Google or whoever else was controlling the map. Like we don't want any more people in DC, so we're not going to provide navigation to it. Um, so yeah. Things happen like that, so be ready for, for planning. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up. <clears throat> you know, I had on my IG channel guys that were living in D.C. Uh, shooting me texts, DMs, and saying, hey, this street is this and this. You know, I didn't solicit any of that information personally, but they just wanted to help out because I had put a news yeah. story up about uh, that exactly happening, is that guys were reporting outages on Google Maps or whatever, mm -hmm. and they were saying, well, you know, I'm here in D.C., this is wrong. This is right. This is what's happening. And it made me think, you know, local contacts and intelligence kind of before you go somewhere or before things happen would be an incredibly invaluable thing to have. So I'm sure that, you know, somebody of your pedigree could kind of speak to that for us. How important is it to have, you know, local contacts somewhere else in, in the uh, area that we might be going or, you know, being able to kind of decipher what intelligence or what information we might need ahead of time? Yeah, especially if it's a trusted contact, because it, it, it's sometimes getting to the point where, you know, what you're watching on the news may not be actually what's occurring, or it could be pre-recorded and they're not letting you know that. Um, so having someone on the ground in these areas, is, it's helpful. Um, but also think about the aspect, if something of that scale is happening. Do we really want to be there ourselves? We want to avoid conflict and conflict and threats. Um, but it's good to have real intel from a human being you trust and you've previously talked to um, to have their point of view of what's happening. Um, as well as you know, if if that out of state contact is someone, you know, where you're planning on bugging out to, maybe you're just getting some intel like, hey, are things still pretty calm uh, up on you know up over there where you live in your neighborhood and because the news is saying that whole state is kind of going under, you know, you can get actual actionable information from them. Yeah. So that's smart. I've, I've been trying to build, I've got a satellite phone and I've been trying to build contacts um, in various regions of the States uh, or the country, I should say. So if cellular goes out, I can pull up my sat phone and contact other people like and find out what's going on. Um, so if any of you guys, have sat phones and you want to reach out with, uh, reach out to me and connect, uh, definitely shoot me a message. Yeah, absolutely. And I really think guys that, you know, the more we can start getting off these platforms and start communicating with each other by alternate means, the better, because these platforms aren't going to be here for, you know, forever. I don't know what time frame we're looking at, but eventually there's going to be some kind of weird rules and you're not going to be able to talk to each other, you know, over IG or whatever. So Get in touch, guys. Get in touch, whether that's email, whether that's whatever it is. Start figuring it out. 
And I'm not trying to say this to sound like a paranoid madman because I firmly believe, to be honest with you guys, that we're going to be okay. The economy is going to come back. It, we're going to keep going. America is a strong nation, and we always have. And I believe that we will. But I also believe that we should be prepping just in case in that 1% chance yeah. something happens. So, Wes, dude, it's been a freaking pleasure talking to you, man. I feel like I could keep going, but I, I'm going to let you get your Sunday evening for your, <laughs> your family and everything. But thank you so much for coming on, man. Hey, well, again, thanks for having me on. I know it's been a while that we talked about it at first, so it's good we finally made it happen. Absolutely. We'll, uh, we'll be in touch and, um, you know, hopefully we'll, uh, get some other cool stuff going. Take care, brother. You too, man. Guys, until next time, I want you to just remember that you are your first and last line of defense, and I will see you in the next Tactical Podcast. <laughs>